and about whether or not you take half a loaf. The problem that I had all along is we were not going to get the half a loaf. If I thought that we were, because of the decision to take transgender out of the coalition and try to pass a bill without, and I thought that maybe tens of thousands of men and women would get new rights because of it, meaning it passed the Senate and was signed by the President of the United States, it would be a tougher call. It's a call that they've had a figure in Albany, and you can argue that they made the same mistake that we made by excluding transgender, and now it'll be years and years before we're able to include them in the, in the state policy. But we were not at that place. And the argument that I had with Congressman Frank, a man who I honor, who's, a, who's an icon in our country, and is someone that I'm going to be telling my grandkids that I was, 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 was honored to serve with, but the disagreement that we had was we were not having a question about do you get half a loaf or three quarters of a loaf. We were trying to decide what the symbolism was going to be. And was the symbolism going to be that we got a vote that allowed people to vote yes, but left out an important element of the coalition, or was the symbolism going to be we stuck together? And I thought it was more important for the, for the future of, of, our, of this issue that we stick together. And it was a debate that was difficult. It pit friend against friend. It pit organization against organization. I think as a tactical matter, we should have, as my grandmother of blessed memory would say, we should have measured twice before we cut once. I don't think we went into this discussion fully having everyone invested in the decision making process. And it created a problem. But I, I, I want to make sure that everyone here understands that I don't, I don't intend and feel that we should dishonor those that disagreed with us. At the end of the day, we did have a lot of people casting the first vote in their political lives to extend constitutional and civil rights to, an element, to large elements of our community. But I thought it was very important that if we're going to stand up on the floor of the United States Congress for an important issue to the GLBT community that we had to make sure that T remained as part of the coalition. And I think we are now strengthened going forward. And I think that we're in a better position going forward. Now there are people that are going to disagree and it was a certain level of irony that I and some of the most hateful voices of the United States House of Representatives cast the same vote on this important thing. But I want you to know I'm not with them. I'm with you. And I think that's important. I think, that, I think that we're also seeing something else. You know, in the presidential campaign, perhaps these issues haven't resonated the way they should. We haven't had the full-throated discussion. But I think there's something that is starting to happen in the country that many of us predicted for some time would. And that is that if you look at pure demographics, look at where young, younger Americans are on the issues of GLBT equality, we are arcing in a place that it is almost inevitable that in our lifetime we're going to see these rights, these basic constitutional rights granted to all citizens. It, not to say that the fight is over, not to say that we can just sit back on our haunches and say, well, more and more young people consider this a, a, a non-controversial issue, even in the, the reddest of red states. But it is something that should inform the way we pursue politics here on now. We still need to move candidates to a point that they talk about these issues more freely. We still need to lean into the idea that there are still people who are going to try to gain political advantage by putting referenda on their state ballots, by pressing courts to make, to make decisions, pressing legislatures. This thing is not in the bag, but I do think that we should feel to some degree comforted by the idea that just about every public opinion poll that emerges says that these issues are receding more and more as the boogeymen issues that they once were. You can see that it is getting more and more difficult to make this issue something that divides us up if you look at some of the, some of the demographics. Which is an argument why I think it is fair for us Whoever our nominee is, and I hope it's Senator Clinton, whoever our nominee is, <laughs> I, think that we need, I think that it's fair that we say that we not only want a seat at the table on these issues, but we want, that we want them to be issues that people ask some, some very foundational things on. I think we are at a point now 
where it's reasonable for us to ask Senator Clinton and Senator Obama, whoever they might be, um, to embrace the idea of gay marriage. Or at very least, ask them. Or at very least, at very least, ask them to not get in our way if this is something that we decide to pursue in the future. Um, I think that still, candidates on a national level are too afraid of their own shadow on these issues. I I believe that it's one of those issues that I think that even people that disagree with you honor you to some degree for fighting. Them. When I ran for Congress the first time, I ran against uh, an icon in the GLBT community named Noah Deer. <laughs> <laughs> and it was then, in 1998, that I, I came out for gay marriage. Now, 1998, I think that year, in, that, in my congressional district, which is a heavy Orthodox, heavy Catholic district, it was, I didn't realize at the time, it was my naivete, I didn't realize that it was the hot button issue, in fairness, that it was. To me, it was, I didn't believe, and even in that district, it would be all that controversial. As it turned out, it was, it was indeed a very contentious issue. So contentious, and I don't know actually if, if Councilman Fiddler had heard the story, that I, I came out, I made, that position, I made that position clear at Lambda of Brooklyn, and a tape recording of my remarks appeared at the Agudath Israel, Israel of America annual dinner on everyone's table. They had a little cassette recorder. No, heavens. <laughs> I, I, you know, and, I, and I told this story later on to, uh, I told this story later on to Barney Frank, who said, uh, there's nothing worse than a fagula with a wire, he said. <laughs> And I, and I remember that it became, it, uh, it came upon us like a storm. We were unaware that, that it was that controversial an issue. It came upon us like a storm. But I found out that something interesting had happened. Is that the issue became for even some people who opposed me and my candidacy. And I didn't get a lot of Orthodox votes that year. Since then, I've, I've won many of them over. But it became for many of them, there was a certain level of respect that I think people had for the idea that even in a tough district like that, I was prepared to say some things that some of my constituents didn't like. I think that I wound up getting elected, not in spite of that position, but to some degree because of it, because it helped define me as someone who was prepared to stake out a view, take a position, even though it was somewhat controversial. And I also realized something else about that issue during that campaign. I had some, I had some very conservative parts of my district in places like Glendale, and Maspeth, and Middle Village. These are places that vote Republican. Never mind that they that I don't vote that, that, that I don't do well in the Democratic primary. They literally are Republican voters. 